Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar entitled Syringe Service Programs, the Essential Roles of Non-Governmental and Community-Based Organizations, hosted by the Office of the Assistant Secretary for Health. My name is Devin Brown from John Snow Incorporated with the JSI team supporting HIV.gov, and I'll be assisting with today's webinar. Before the presentation begins, I'd like to highlight the main features of your webinar interface. The audio for today's presentation is accessible via computer or headset. You can click on the up arrow next to audio settings to change your speaker settings. For today's webinar, attendees will be in listen-only mode. You can access a number of important webinar features using the toolbar at the bottom of your screen, including the webinar chat icon and the Q&A icon. If you need technical assistance during the webinar, please type your question using the chat icon and one of our technical support staff will respond to you directly. If you have questions for our presenters, please enter them at any time using the Q&A icon at the bottom of your screen. Questions will be addressed at the end of the presentation. Finally, please be aware that this presentation is being recorded. I will now turn it over to Sharon Ricks with the Office of the Assistant Secretary for Health. Sharon? Thank you, Devin, and welcome to all of our participants. It is my pleasure to greet you on behalf of the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services and the Office of the Assistant Secretary for Health. We are excited that so many of you have joined us today. My name is Sharon Ricks, and I'm one of 10 regional health administrators across the nation who work to catalyze public health action on important issues through our regional expertise and networks. Today, we are pleased to present our final webinar in a three-part series in partnership with our Office of Infectious Disease and HIV AIDS Policy. The title of this webinar is Syringe Service Programs, the Essential Roles of Non-Governmental and Community-Based Organizations. We will explore questions like, what are the key tactics that guide coalitions in their work? And how can you partner with them to create change where you live? How do you build successful partnerships between law enforcement and public health? And how do you navigate the most important aspect of a syringe service program, the human connection? Our speakers will include Daniel Raymond, Deputy Director of Planning and Policy with the Harm Reduction Coalition, Chuck Wexler, Executive Director of the Police Executive Research Forum, and Grace Keller, Program Coordinator with the Howard Center Safe Recovery Program. Next slide. Please note the following disclaimer. The opinions, findings, and conclusions expressed by speakers during this webinar are strictly their own and do not necessarily represent the opinion, views, or policies of the Office of the Assistant Secretary for Health and the Department of Health and Human Services, nor does mention of trade names, commercial practices, or organizations imply endorsement. References to publications, news sources, and non-governmental federal websites are provided solely for informational purposes and do not imply endorsement by OASH or HHS. OASH and HHS assume no responsibility for the factual accuracy of the content of the individual organizations found at non-federal links. When the webinar ends, a new window will appear, and you'll click on that window and provide feedback on today's session. We'll also send you an email with a recording of the webinar, a link to the presentation slides, and the contact information for your regional health administrator. Next slide. Our department recognizes that syringe service programs, or SSPs, are a key component in reducing the transmission of infectious disease, preventing overdoses, and promoting long-term recovery. These programs can offer access to sterile syringes and injection equipment, as well as other healthcare services, such as vaccinations for hepatitis A and B and influenza, testing and linkage to care for infectious diseases, such as HIV, viral hepatitis, and other sexually transmitted infections, naloxone and training to prevent overdoses, and linkage to medication-assisted treatment for substance use disorder and other needed services, such as primary care. We know that people who participate in SSPs are five times more likely to enter drug treatment and three and a half times more likely to stop injecting compared to those who don't. Next slide. Opioid and drug misuse is linked to marked increases in hepatitis and HIV. 
This slide highlights 46 states, DC and Puerto Rico, which are experiencing or at risk for significant increases in hepatitis infection or an HIV outbreak due to injection drug use. The green areas show those jurisdictions that are experiencing or at risk for outbreaks and the pink areas show the top 220 vulnerable communities in 25 states. And for those of you who noticed that pink cluster around Kentucky, Ohio, and West Virginia, please know that plans are underway at multiple levels to develop a regional framework to address infectious disease associated with drug use in that area of the country. The next slide. In 2017, HHS launched a comprehensive five-point strategy to empower local communities on the front lines of the opioid crisis. The strategy focuses on being better in five areas. Number one, better access to prevention, treatment, and recovery services, and that includes SSPs. Number two, better data that is more timely and specific and improves our understanding of the crisis. Number three, better management for pain approaches that are healthy and evidence-based. Number four, better targeting of overdose re reversing drugs and SSPs can help in that area as well. And number five, better research on pain and addiction. Next slide. HHS is dedicated to informing communities about SSPs as a critical public health intervention. And on November 6, 2019, Admiral Giroir, our Assistant Secretary for Health, released a blog highlighting the fact that comprehensive syringe services programs have the proven ability to help combat the opioid crisis and prevent the spread of infectious disease linked to injection drug use. Slide seven. HHS has several resources available to support the implementation of SSPs. You will find a suite of materials at www.cdc.gov SSP. Also, CDC recently awarded funding to the National Alliance of State and Territorial AIDS Directors to develop a national network that provides harm reduction and technical assistance that is responsive to the needs of states and local jurisdictions. Also, Ryan White HIV AIDS Program and the Substance Abuse Prevention and Treatment Block Grant make additional resources available. Next slide. Today's webinar is a part of an effort led by the Office of the Assistant Secretary for Health to collaborate with federal, state, and county stakeholders to create and expand syringe service programs in vulnerable communities across the nation. This is a map of the 10 HHS regions that are currently engaged in this work. And at the close of the webinar, we will provide an update on our activities. Next slide. Our first presenter is Daniel Raymond. He has worked in the field of harm reduction for over two and a half decades and currently serves as the Deputy Director of Planning and Policy with the Harm Reduction Coalition. Daniel. Thank you so much, Sharon, and welcome everybody. I'm so glad to see so much interest and I'm honored to be part of this fantastic webinar series and appreciate the leadership of the ASH and the Regional Health Administrators and HHS in uh, bringing more light and discussion to syringe services programs. Uh, I'm with the National Harm Reduction Coalition. Uh, we're celebrating our 25th year and we are an advocacy and capacity building organization. Um, I want to also acknowledge that we're having this webinar a uh, day after Trans Day of Remembrance um, and I'm mindful of the various and diverse populations that can benefit from certain services programs. Next slide, please. So Sharon laid out uh, very succinctly the strong case for syringe services programs. I want to spend uh, my time on this webinar talking a little bit about how we at National Harm Reduction Coalition think about, talk about, and support syringe services programs around the country. And so uh, we think of them uh, as a vital strategy for HIV prevention as well as viral hepatitis, but Beyond that, we look at them as outreach and engagement platforms, that effective programs are excellent at reaching people who are disconnected from healthcare, from the substance use treatment system, from 
mainstream services um, and engaging and retaining them and offering a platform to layer on other services, other kinds of care. It could be reproductive health care, vaccination, case management, housing support. So these programs play a vital role that sometimes it's the, it's the middle S, the services part, that, uh, that we forget about in comprehensive syringe services programs as we emphasize the syringe part. We also see them as sentinel sites and rapid response for public health and other threats, whether it's the emergence of fentanyl and the drug supply and the attending increase in overdose risk, or the hepatitis A outbreaks that we've seen in many parts of the country over the last year or two, where certain services programs were integral in rapid diffusion of education and hepatitis A vaccine. Uh, I think it's well recognized now that uh, certain services programs have been innovators on overdose response and in fact were pioneers uh, led by the work of Dan Big and colleagues at Chicago Recovery Alliance going back two decades now and more on uh, making naloxone, the overdose reversal drug, widely available to people in a position to witness an overdose, including people who use drugs themselves. And finally, we see them as hubs for comprehensive services. And I'll speak more about an example of that in a moment. Next slide, please. Uh, so you've heard some of this if you were on one of the past two webinars, but this has been a really dynamic space uh, in the last four years in particular, both on the policy side and the program implementation side. By our best judgment, there's over 400 programs in operation around the United States. And this represents uh, at least a 60% increase since 2015 alone. So we're seeing rapid growth and even the longer standing programs are reporting higher utilization. Uh, we also now have legal frameworks for authorized syringe services programs in roughly three quarters of the states. And again, that represents a significant shift in momentum since 2015, where over a dozen states have passed legislation to establish or expand the legal frameworks under which syringe services programs can operate. However, there is some more work to do in the remaining states. Given that though, it's important to remember that uh, according to a report from CDC a couple of years ago, <laughs> when they looked at people, young people diagnosed with hepatitis C, so people under 30 who inject drugs, they found that in 80% of the diagnoses that these people lived at least 10 miles from the nearest certain services program, representing the fact that despite the 400 programs in operation, that we're going to need hundreds, if not thousands more to be widely successful and envision a scenario where we have universal access to syringe services programs and harm reduction in general. Next slide, please. So I wanted to talk a bit about the framework that we at the National Harm Reduction Coalition have adopted in pursuit of this goal of universal access to certain services programs. And we see it as a four part strategy where each part needs to be advanced and scaled up and working in harmony. I'll go into a little depth on each of these, but the first quadrant on the upper left is optimal policies. Uh, the second reflects robust implementation. The third is sustainable financing. And the fourth is supportive communities. Next slide. So optimal policies. So here we're talking about state legislation. I spoke a moment ago about uh, states that have legal frameworks enabling or authorizing certain services programs to operate. Uh, but also this could extend to local ordinances um, as well as any state regulations or guidance that's attached to funding. That as much as possible, we want to make sure that the policy environment is aligned to be not only supportive of certain services programs, but fostering best practices. Uh, so we feel like there's some more work to do. Uh, if people are interested in looking at the legal and policy environment in their state, they can check out Law Atlas, which recently updated uh, their inventory of state public health laws relative to certain services programs. And we think that there are opportunities and a lot of the work that we do on a day-to-day -day basis is building advocacy capacity, uh, educating policymakers, and supporting the emergence of 
leadership around the country to be the real champions in their communities on helping to educate and advocate for certain services programs. Next slide, please. So robust implementation happens on a few different layers uh, that when people approach us to say that we're considering to start a certain services program, we have a number of different conversations with them. And so a lot of our work over the last 25 years has been about meeting the training and technical assistance needs for new programs or growing programs or existing organizations that want to integrate certain services programs. And I think there's a lot of rich opportunities, whether it's federally qualified health centers, homeless outreach programs, recovery community organizations, STD clinics, aid service organizations that while we see a lot of standalone certain services programs that are mission driven and dedicated to the health of people who use drugs, any program that touches, connects with, intersects with people who use drugs on a regular basis could consider implementing certain services in their organization. So we provide guidance on operational issues and identification and dissemination of best practices and promising models and a lot of peer-to-peer -peer learning. Next slide, please. Funding is clearly an issue when we're talking about not only the growth of new programs and increased demand on existing programs, but real opportunities to scale up into something that's more sustainable. So historically, there has not been dedicated or categorical federal funding for certain services programs. More funding opportunities have opened up and the links that uh, Sharon provided uh, to some of the federal websites have some information about that. But we think that there's some opportunities to collectively devise more innovative financing and mechanisms and look at alternate funding streams. So there's been some work in New York, for example, to tap into Medicaid reimbursement. Some of that will depend on analyzing resource and capacity gaps and really thinking through the budgetary needs and return on investment of these programs and how they're relevant to various payers. And while we advocate for federal investments, we recognize that there's a lot of different players that can uh, meaningfully support the and cultivate the growth of these programs. And if there are any public or private funders who are interested in exploring how they can support these programs on the ground, please feel free to uh, reach out to me. Next slide, please. And finally, our fourth quadrant in our 50 state framework for universal access refers to uh, ensuring community support. So we've seen in some areas with emerging dialogues or program implementation that some certain services programs can attract controversy. And our next speaker will talk to an aspect of that in terms of navigating uh, buy-in and commitment from law enforcement, but we also see concerns related to homelessness, related to syringe litter. We feel that there's a strong evidence base for these programs, but more importantly, there's a strong value space that can pull in people, regardless of where they stand on the political spectrum, from different communities, uh, from different vantage points. Uh, so some of the work that we're doing to help support programs on the ground and policymakers is a faith-based initiative that we've launched at Harm Reduction Coalition called Faith in Harm Reduction. But we also think that there's meaningful roles for people who use drugs, people in recovery, and family members to be ambassadors and communicate the real value of these programs to their communities. Next slide, please. I want to highlight a few key tactics that present opportunities that people on this call, regardless of whether they're running an SSP, contemplating running an SSP, or in a position to provide support for an SSP, could consider. Uh, in our experience over the last several years in particular, that we found that convening and building networks has across syringe services programs and between syringe services programs and other constituents can be invaluable, not just for the diffusion of information and best practices and problem solving, but really uh, for identifying opportunities for broader collaboration, uh, 
broader progress and broader mutual support. The, a lot of these programs can operate with a sense of isolation, so these networks, and I've included a few examples. So California Syringe Exchange Network, uh, the Injection Drug User Health Alliance in New York City, and a new initiative that we've launched called HEP Connect to support syringe services programs and other groups working on preventing hepatitis C amongst people who inject drugs in Kentucky, Indiana, Tennessee, West Virginia, North Carolina. We see the strength of these networks and I think that they're a core part of resiliency. We also want to expand the range of services. So I mentioned earlier these, these programs as platforms. New York State has started to fund integration of uh, drug user healthcare at certain services programs such as hepatitis C, buprenorphine, and lastly, meaningful involvement of people who use drugs from the point of view of employment and advocacy. Next slide, please. And so I'm about at the end of my time, but I'll just offer a few resources that we have. Uh, we have some resource guides on our website, including a fairly comprehensive implementation manual and a manual on rural syringe services programs. Uh, we're working on developing and releasing more tools, including some online training modules, a few of which are already up. And we have the largest convening in the country coming up in a little under a year at the National Harm Reduction Conference, which will be held in San Juan, Puerto Rico next year, and more information is available at that link. And so now I'm gonna turn it back to Sharon. Thank you. Thank you so much, Daniel. Your 50 state four part strategy focused on policy, implementation, financing, and supportive communities is really a great recipe for how to make harm reduction work and I appreciate your presentation. Our next presenter is Chuck Wexler, Executive Director of the Police Executive Research Forum. And Chuck leads an organization of law enforcement officials and others who are dedicated to improving the professionalism of policing. Chuck? Okay, <clears throat> thank you, Sharon. And uh, it's nice to be with you today. And thank you for what HHS is doing in this area. <clears throat> Just a little bit about the Police Executive Research Forum. <clears throat> We have been around for over 40 years. We're um, both a think tank and a membership organization. We uh, focus on issues mostly from the larger cities, but also all across the country. So we get to look at what policing looks like um, from a number of perspectives. Um, we've written guidelines on body-worn cameras. We've looked at issues of police suicide, and dealing with the mental health issues, dealing with the homeless. Um, uh, use of force has been a major concern for us the last uh, five years. Um, the issue of, of drugs in particular and what we've seen the last five years really impacts a lot of those areas I've talked about in terms of the homeless or those with mental health issues or use of force issues. Um, we have been focused uh, on what I would say is, has been an epidemic for the past five years. Um, this opioid epidemic, uh, as you know, uh, results in almost 200 people a day dying. Uh, I don't think there's any more significant domestic policy issue than this opioid epidemic that we have faced. And um, in, in many ways, uh, uh, we picked up on it in 2014 uh, when we brought together uh, several hundred people to talk about what we were seeing. And that was five years ago in this heroin epidemic. And also at the same time, uh, uh, saw changing uh, perspectives on marijuana. So two things were going on. Um, and then uh, we followed that up with a, uh, another meeting in 2016, which we brought together law enforcement and public health agencies. And I think that's really the centerpiece of what I'd like to say here today is that this collaboration between public health agencies and law enforcement is very important because in many ways, you know, you look at a problem and you say to yourself, well, whose responsibility is this? And this epidemic um, it really cuts across both law enforcement and public health issues. Uh, you can go into um, any city today and you, you will know that in places like New York City, a 
1,500 people die, Philadelphia, 1,600 um, up in uh, places, rural areas of Vermont, New Hampshire. Uh, it's it's significant, significant impact. West Virginia, Kentucky, there are parts of the country that just uh, are astonishing. We follow that up in 2017 with uh, uh, looking at uh, how health agencies are responding. And then in 2018, uh, we did 10 standards of care. And that, um, the most recent, I wanna talk about the most recent uh, factor, next slide, uh, the 10 standards of care uh, are really important. We, we work with Johns Hopkins uh, University on this. And really, we were looking at uh, basically 10 things and that was focusing on overdose deaths using naloxone. Now, let me just say a word about naloxone. Naloxone has been a major breakthrough uh, in police departments across the country. It, you, would, you would be amazed at how many uh, saves everyday departments uh, are having because they are equipping police officers with naloxone. Uh, I venture to say that the 200 people we lose a day might even be you know, a factor of, of two. Uh, three times as many people uh, if departments did not use naloxone. So that is a major change in uh, policing. Um, treatment is very significant, um, but uh, also, you know, uh, departments now are recognizing that arresting people who have addiction problems really doesn't work. And that's, that's a big far cry from, uh, you know, 20, 25 years ago. I was uh, assistant to the first drug czar and um, and that's when we had a cocaine epidemic. And if you look at how policing was then versus today, a major sea change. So today, police officers are carrying the naloxone, but also um, in, importantly, they are recognizing that when someone has an addiction issue, you know, simply arresting them is not really going to do any good. As a matter of fact, it's probably counterproductive, but getting them into treatment uh, is very significant. Um, and I'll come back to the, uh, the focus of today's talk, but the, the big driver that's really uh, costing so many lives is fentanyl. Fentanyl is, is a synthetic derivative that comes from China and uh, is, uh, is really uh, uh, significantly impacting um, uh, the country. So the, the major uh, uh, point I want to make about the 10 standards of care was our standard number seven, which was picking up on HIV and hepatitis outbreaks. And, and that's something very significant uh, we saw. Uh, and I think this is a sea change for police departments, is a recognition that in addition to the uh, opioid epidemic, what we're seeing is this breakout of HIV and hepatitis. And, um, and so departments have come uh, to the recognition that doing something about this epidemic means something, doing something about well-managed syringe service programs. Now, if you had said to a police chief 10 years ago, would they be supportive of syringe service programs? You probably wouldn't have gotten much support, but there's a recognition that this epidemic is spread by, that syringes have a significant impact on that. So, so that's how much policing has changed. There's a recognition that, um, that you know, managing syringe services is, is a significant impact on this epidemic. Okay, next slide. Um, a big part of that uh, is, is it's the syringe services programs, is, is recognizing that this isn't just handing in syringes. Uh, that's very important that people, when they come in, should be have access to treatment services. And, and so that's a really important way to get to people, is to both stop the epidemic, but also try to get them help. Uh, and also, this affects police officers too. Um, and one of the ways to get buy-in from police officers is a recognition that um, having a program like this, having people bring needles in, exchanging them, also impacts officers' risk 
And that was really important in getting buying in. And, and it's, it, this, this isn't something that um, you can do overnight. You need leadership, you need political leadership, you need community support. Okay, next one. Huntington, West Virginia is, uh, is probably ground zero in this whole area. Uh, it, as you can see, uh, this is a um, population of 50,000. So this is a relatively small community that had a major overdose problem, 34 fatal on the first six months of 2015. And so now this is a you know, fairly um, you know, mainstream uh, rural community. You would never have thought that they would get to the point that they would be accepting of a syringe exchange program, but they came to realize that they had an, an incredible epidemic on their hands and they had to do something about it. So they needed political leadership. They needed the, the chief's uh, involvement. They, everybody had to come together to recognize that they needed to do something about this. And that's really what, what they did. There was a, you know, a, a real recognition that they had to change. And so that's what they did. They implemented this program. At the same time, they uh, implemented naloxone. And it had a, a significant impact back in 2015. Um, next slide. So there was really three parts to what they did. The first was to raise awareness very important is to get that buy-in at the local level, is to get, you know, a, a, a consensus that they needed to change gears. They were seeing, literally, they were seeing their neighbors dying right and left. Um, and so they had, to, they had to change what they were doing. So that was really important. They needed a coalition of supporters. Um, and, and they did that one at a time. And then, as I say, they needed the buy-in from top officials, police, uh, to really make a difference. And, you know, the police had to be involved. And, but, you know, there was a concern, why were the police involved? Well, the police were involved there to make sure that everybody was safe, that people, you know, felt safe and that, 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 that they, the people coming in weren't going to be arrested, but that also very important part of this is that there'd be treatment there, is that there'd be counselors there, that there'd be, you know, follow-up. But if you just had a program and it was simply exchanging needles. You know, that would not that would not make uh, that would not meet the uh, the needs of the program. So that was really um, really important. Um, next slide. So all of this is to say we've really changed. Policing has really dramatically changed its approach. Uh, to dealing with the opioid epidemic. There's an awareness that you need to have uh, public health partners, and that's extremely important. This is, this is not an issue that's gonna be uh, solved on the law enforcement front, but you also need treatment. And one of the challenges is not every community can afford the treatment. So that, that's a major challenge, and you need to have uh, a buy-in from all of the stakeholders. Uh, this doesn't happen overnight. Um, and, and importantly, uh, the role of naloxone has proven to be uh, very significant. Uh, we're still, even back in Huntington today, um, it, we still, there's still challenges. They closed down uh, a neighboring um, exchange program, which put more pressure on Huntington, um, and, and they couldn't really, they could not meet the demand. So um, things, um, you know, are, are not great, but, but let's just say that uh, the exchange program has gone a long way in helping to stop the spread of HIV and saving lives. So uh, the good news is that many police departments understand uh, what's going on, are equipping their office with naloxone, are trying to get people into treatment, uh, and are much more understanding that this whole drug issue um, is an issue that's not going to be solved by simply locking people up. But, uh, but it, is, it will be uh, successful if you have a collaborative approach. Um, Sharon, thank you. 
Thank you, Chuck. And you remind us how important it is that not only can we reduce infections and disease outbreaks and help people find treatment and protect officers, but that we can also save lives with naloxone distribution. So thank you for highlighting that significant role. And our next presenter is Grace Keller, and she's the program coordinator for the Howard Center for Safe Recovery Program. And this is Vermont's oldest and largest syringe service program. Grace has extensive hands-on experience providing case management support to clients who struggle with opioid dependence and frequently provides testimony for the Vermont State Legislature on bills related to substance use recovery and treatment. Grace? Hi, thank you so much. Um, may, as I really appreciate being asked to be on this panel, especially with the other guests. Um, so thank you for having me and hearing Vermont's perspective. Um, as Sharon said, we are Vermont's oldest and largest SSP. Um, we've been in operation for about 19 years. Um, we're also the only full-time syringe exchange in Vermont. And um, we are the oldest and largest distributor of Narcan. We've been distributing Narcan or Naloxone since 2013. Um, and we've distributed over 25,000 doses. So next slide, please. Um, what I talk about typically first is our approach because I think anytime you're looking at syringe service programs or thinking about starting a syringe service program, the approach is absolutely critical um, and there's some fundamental tenets that really um, help provide a good foundation for syringe exchange and help to start the relationship with the drug using population. So. Um, what we do is we have a very client-centered and non-judgmental approach, and where we meet people where they are. And I know everybody's heard that those things many times, but it's really something that you have to constantly be focused on and aware of, um, and it becomes second nature, but it's really a, a fundamental uh, tenant of syringe service programs. We have drop-in services so that um, people don't require an appointment. They're very consistent hours, so we're open Monday through Friday, nine to five, so people really know um, that when they show up that we're gonna be there, that we're open, that they can get the services that they need, and then they can come and go as they please. Um, we also do a needs-based distribution, which is um, very important in Vermont and as in other places. Um, we give people the amount of syringes that they ask for so that they have coverage for themselves and anybody that they might be using with or that they might know is using. Um, we rely heavily on secondary sy syringe exchange in Vermont. Uh, we have people that are coming from very rural areas. We have people that come long distances. And again, we're the only full-time syringe exchange. So um, we make sure that we have a needs-based distribution um, model. We have a high positive regard for the client. So um, that goes without saying for a lot of people who do this work, but it is very important that um, clients feel that they are not being judged, that they're being um, given the benefit of the doubt. Clients are um, survivors and they are experts in their own life and honoring that is a very important uh, way to begin or um, you know, exist in a relationship with um, our participants. And um, obviously it's very important to be anonymous and low barrier so people can come and go as they please. They can um, uh, choose from a menu of options. They get to uh, decide what works for them and what doesn't on, on any given day um, and really try out different services. I also think it's critical, I'm a big um, proponent of having a lot of services under one roof so that we can really move people throughout um, the interventions and options without having to send them to a different place or go to different appointments or to meet with people that, um, that might not happen to be there on that day. We really wanna make sure that everybody on staff is versed in um, any sort of option or uh, interest that someone might have. Um, next slide, please. So like I said, these are the services that we provide at Safe Recovery. Um, we've been doing syringe exchange for almost 20 years, uh, we, and we've always been needs-based. We do community case management and advocacy, and this is critical because a lot of our um, participants are struggling with a lot of other issues and systems. 85% uh, of our clients have experienced homelessness in their lifetime. Many of them are dealing with the Department of Corrections and the Department of Children and Families. Um, many of them experience things like food insecurity. So we find that having case managers 
who can help support them in, in uh, accessing those services is critical. Um, we do Narcan and Naloxone distribution and overdose prevention. Um, we distribute to um, the Vermont's law is anyone who might be present at an overdose, so clients um, or participants, family members, friends, um, and we've done a thousand provider trainings in the community. So we've gone out to schools and colleges, homeless and battered uh, spouse shelters, um, you know, a diverse different options because we and uh, sober living houses. Um, so that any time that someone might overdose, there, there's the potential that somebody would be there, have Narcan, and know how to respond. Um, we also distribute fentanyl testing strips. I think some of the main ways that you prevent overdose is making sure that there's Narcan available, making sure that people are aware if they're using fentanyl, and also um, access to treatment in a timely manner on request. So I'll get to that. Um, we do HIV and hepatitis C testing and linkage to medical care. We're very lucky that Vermont's largest hospital is less than a mile from us and we have um, a good connection with them so that if somebody tests positive, we can usually get them an appointment most often in the same day if they're interested, but often, but um, in the same week. We also have very good um, coverage for those medications for both HIV and hepatitis C, so it's a great time to get people treatment. Um, we have drug treatment options counseling and referral, and just recently we opened our, debuted our low barrier buprenorphine treatment on site. So um, for many years we had the um, recognition of being the program that put more people on the waiting list for treatment in Vermont um, than any other program. We had a two-year waiting list for medication-assisted treatment. It felt terrible. Um, I think nobody gets into this work to say no to people. And we had um, put hundreds of people on that waiting list every year. Uh, we worked hard to reduce that waiting list, but it still um, took days and sometimes weeks to get people into treatment. Um, all the while, we knew that the best place to be doing it was at our office. So um, we opened our low barrier buprenorphine program and uh, literally a year ago, and um, I will talk about that later on. We also, Vermont's very rural, so people rely heavily on either public transportation or have very insecure transportation, so we would do transportation assistance, hepatitis A and B vaccinations, and we have a legal clinic um, that serves anything but criminal, um, uh, helps with anything but criminal charges. Uh, so we have very robust expungement law in Vermont, um, evictions, and uh, they can help with evictions, expungement, um, Department of Children and Families, disability, those kind of things. So that's right on site too, again, all under one roof. Uh, next slide, please. So here are our numbers. We have over 5,000 members. Um, that's since the beginning of time. Um, we have distributed over 25,000 doses of Narcan, and we've had over 1,400 people come back and say they've used it. The slide you see there is a picture. Um, we actually have a tally in our um, exchange so that people know to tell us about their experiences using Narcan and that we can actually keep an accurate count. Um, so we, as uh, Chuck was talking about, have been hit hard with fentanyl. For the majority of my career, which I've been here 12 years, and the time that we've been open, 20, when on intake, we asked people if they witnessed an overdose and 23 to 26% typically said that they had. Um, and that's for about 18 or 17 of the years we've been open. Uh, and in one year, that number jumped up to 81%. So we had a very, fentanyl came here very quickly um, and we had very serious consequences as a result. Um, and we lost more people in 18 months than we did in 16 years prior to that combined. So we worked really hard to make sure that, um, that we had Narcan and that's also when we started distributing fentanyl testing strips and looking at getting treatment available on demand. Uh, next slide, please. So as we've talked about in this, um, but it can't be understated, the most important aspect of a syringe service program is the human connection. Um, we treat people with respect and we honor that, the, again, that they're experts in their own lives. And we provide services that give them a menu of options to keep them alive and safer. We work very hard to cut through stigma and shame that people live with, um, but what we notice is that uh, people come back, people refer their friends. Um, I can show you next slide, please. 
we are um, required to do a, um, a participant survey on their experience and every year for client satisfaction, 100% of our clients say, this is last year's survey, um, say they received the help they needed, that they the services were right for them, that the staff treated them with respect. Um, so these are all what's really important to me and to our program is to make sure that clients feel empowered, engaged, and treated with respect. Um, and I think that that's how we effectively help them move through other interventions and get, get them other services and support. Um, next slide, please. Um, so lastly, like I said, we opened our low barrier buprenorphine program at Safe Recovery in October of um, 2018. And one of the things we were worried about is what, um, whether we would get a physician that was harm reduction focused. And I'm happy to say that we have three physicians and we have served 146 people have been inducted um, into our program. We currently are serving 70 for participants um, and we work to getting people into the traditional system of the hub and spoke or private doctors and clinics but we also wrote a large SAMHSA grant um, to really target the people that the system wasn't able to engage or retain um, so people who had been kicked out of the clinic of, of our methadone and suboxone clinic here um, and sometimes people get permanent bans for things like violence or um, or uh, accusations of drug selling. And really what, when it happens to, when they get banned from the highest level of care, they really, the system doesn't apply to them anymore. So we wrote a large SAMHSA grant to, or we were given a large SAMHSA grant to really provide services to that population. And I'm happy, really proud to say that we have a 96% retention rate. So 96% of them are either in treatment with us or have been successfully transitioned to another um, hub or a spoke. So that's um, really what the, the target was, is really getting at everybody and making sure that treatment does apply to anybody. Um, lastly, we also have treatment on demand at our hospital 24 hours a day here. And the big, the big piece that happened too is we advocated strongly for um, the Department of Corrections to provide medication assisted treatment to anybody who um, needs it in the prison. And that became a law in 2018 in Vermont. So when we had treatment on demand and robust Narcan um, services and syringe service program, um, we looked at our data and realized that we had a 50% reduction in accidental overdose rates in our county. So I think having treatment on demand simultaneously with the Department of Corrections treating people with buprenorphine and methadone has been a monumental shift and where uh, the numbers almost immediately um, became clear to us, but in the first year we had a 50% reduction. So that's been very exciting, um, but I'm happy to and excited to hear about your questions. Thank you so much again for having me. Thank you, Grace. Your experience in supporting clients who struggle with opioid dependence is a powerful lesson in how to navigate the most important aspect of syringe service programs, and that's that human connection. And I want to thank you and all of our presenters. So on the next slide, I want to give you a little update on what the regional offices have been working on. We've been meeting with federal, state, and other stakeholders to discuss the current state of SSPs, to identify state and community specific specific challenges and opportunities and to create and expand SSPs in vulnerable communities. So far across our 10 regions, we've met with 22 states and nearly 80 individuals representing federal, state, and community governments, universities, associations, law enforcement, harm reduction, and other community organizations. And we're in the process of compiling those outcomes and identifying trends, specific needs, and opportunities. And we're going to share these outcomes with federal agencies that can help inform our follow-up actions as we work to expand syringe services programs in vulnerable communities. And now we get an opportunity to hear from you, our participants. And you can go to the next slide for this. If you haven't already, please type your questions into the Q&A pod and we will address as many as we can. If we don't have an opportunity to address your question today, please know that it is valued and we will review all the questions and comments and analyze the type of issues that are raised from various sectors and regions of the country. And this is gonna help inform our future efforts. 
and I'm now pleased to welcome Karina Dan in the Office of Infectious Disease and HIV AIDS Policy, who will facilitate the Q&A. Karina? Thank you so much, Sharon. Uh, I also want to thank all of our speakers for providing some really great uh, background information, uh, some resources, uh, and uh, sharing their experience. It, uh, clearly, there's a, a huge need uh, to support expanding syringe service programs in the United States. And uh, I think I also really need to thank the, the registrants. Um, this is the first webinar where we asked in advance whether people had questions and the response was overwhelming. Um, so in advance we had a number of questions uh, that I think really get to uh, you know what people are thinking and their needs. Um, in addition of course we're monitoring the question and answer box so please don't hesitate to add uh, your question that occurred to you d during the webinar, <laughs> um, and, and we'll try to get to all of them today. Um, so uh, the first question I'd like to direct to Chuck Wexler, um, in terms of getting buy-in and support for syringe service programs with the law enforcement community, I think a lot of communities have uh, trouble figuring out how to make the case and and work with law enforcement have you could you give the listeners any advice or suggestions for effective strategies to get that buy-in from top law enforcement officials in their area well I think I think it's uh, it's an education effort I think uh, this is where uh, the collaboration with uh, public health is so important. You know, law enforcement needs to be educated about um, syringe services. They, you know, the, the first reaction is usually, usually a visceral reaction, like that you're going to make the problem worse. So I think it's important to get a good grounding from public health officials. And so that's where I think reaching out to local law enforcement and sitting down with them, explaining um, you know the nature of the, the of the epidemic, the nature of what how HIV is spread, showing them you know examples, uh, really you know kind of bringing them along and understanding what is the nature of the problem in your community, and then you know presenting to them how it could be different. In some ways, this might require you know having them visit another community where this has been implemented. So I think a big part of it is education and getting them the kind of information they need. And then once they are, are, are sold on it or understand it better, then what I think uh, police need to do is work with elected officials. You know, law enforcement brings a lot of credibility to communities. So if you have someone that stands up and says, you know what, we don't just have uh, an epidemic in terms of uh, uh, heroin, we also have the potential for spreading of HIV. And here's how I think we can make a difference. These aren't just, we're just not going to be giving out syringes. We're going to get treatment in there. We're going to get social workers. We're going to get people to help these people. So I think you have to work hard at developing that collaboration between public health and law enforcement. Thanks, Chuck. And just a quick follow on, you showed a document building successful partnerships between law enforcement and public health agencies. Is that resource available on your website? Yes, it is. Yes, it is. And our website is www.policeforum.org. Thank you so much. Um, so I'd like to just open that up. I think we've heard a num from a number of the participants that they're really new um, in uh, at working at syringe service programs and you know finding that support um, and I wonder if uh, Daniel and Grace can add something uh, more to the to the answer um, from a non a law enforcement perspective um, maybe Daniel uh, sure I can start I you know I remember back uh, when I started um, in New York City, and we were trying to build support for a uh, certain services program in the Lower East Side of Manhattan. Um, and it took a lot of showing up and making sure that that we knew the community and that the community knew us. Um, and I think that sometimes that 
you know, I, I remember going to meetings at community gardens. I remember knocking on the doors of uh, the head of the neighborhood association, going to the uh, local community board meetings, uh, but also going to table at the uh, local Puerto Rican Day event. And that a lot of it is really about being a regular and consistent presence and understanding people's concerns. I think like Chuck said, for some people, this will seem counterintuitive and that there's a lot of opportunities to really delve deeper into that because I think that, that a lot of our neighbors and a lot of our uh, key opinion leaders and key stakeholders have some experience of substance use in their personal or social networks or families. And that can work for us, but it can also lead some people to initially lay on a whole set of assumptions based on their experience that may predispose them to be skeptical. But um, honest conversation, I think like I suggested during my presentation, think about enlisting supportive allies like people in recovery, like family members, but I think increasingly importantly, the voices of people who use drugs themselves. We've seen a real groundswell over the last couple of years of people who use drugs uh, self-organizing into sometimes they call themselves users' unions or survivors' unions to really talk about why these services are important to them, what their needs are, what their perspective is, and that not only humanizes the issue in a, in a stigma framework, but really grounds the issue in how we take care of our neighbors. Thanks, Daniel. Grace, you're uh, in a, a rural state though arguably uh, sort of the city part of that state. Um, but um, did you, do you have anything to add regarding um, how your, the Howard Center was able to get buy-in or maintain buy-in through these uh, many years of operating? You know, it's, it's, um, it's not always been a smooth, uh, a smooth process, but I think um, a lot of what Daniel said is what I would say is, um, you know, I think sometimes because these conversations are hard, people shy away from them or just do the work and, um, and, and it's hard to get out into the community and talk. But what I've found is that we really work hard to stay in the community, talk about what's going on, be a resource for the community. Um, we have a great relationship with our police department right now. We're very lucky in that um, our police chief is uh, very focused on syringe service programs, very focused on harm reduction. And that's become from his conversations with other areas, but also his conversations with us. And I believe strongly too in, in bringing people in to see what you do. Never when clients are there. Um, when clients are, or participants are there, our doors are shut to the public. But we have um, hours in the morning and hours in the evening where we bring people in to see what we do and have a better idea of what goes on and sort of demystifies everything. And through that, we've worked really hard to build relationships. I do think another piece that Daniel said that I found is the best way to cut through stigma and to work through getting people the resources they need is to hear from people with lived experience, both people who use drugs, people in recovery, people who've lost family members and loved ones. Um, I think, you know, um, people demonstrating success, but also demanding and, sh and talking about what they need and what helps them um, to be healthier really does help. And that's, um, they're our best champions, our best uh, ways to get through to people. And then finding random um, champions in places that you didn't necessarily know existed. We have a church up the street from us that found out that we've, we've had some financial struggles throughout the years and some very significant ones. And the person who runs the church uh, grounds wrote an amazing letter to our legislature about our funding. Um, so people who, happen that, that you don't even notice that know the value of your program, um, you know, really enlisting people that, that are important community members that may not be the most obvious. So I think that's really all I have to say. Those are some terrific ideas. And I actually want to add as um, a former health department um, staff person, I was approached by our syringe service program uh, when, I, when I started my job 
and uh, found it to be one of the best uh, partnerships that, uh, that I had during my time at the health department. So um, it, occasionally there's some resistance uh, from health department staff, but I would encourage folks um, who haven't yet connected with their health uh, department folks to to let them know that they're there, let them know uh, what they're doing, and and ask about opportunities for collaboration and mutual support. Um, one of the big questions, of course, that we hear uh, frequently is around funding uh, for syringe services programs, and so I did want to refer. Um, folks who want to know about what HHS uh, agencies, uh, CDC, SAMHSA, and HRSA are doing to support syringe service programs, I wanted to refer all of you back to webinar number one, uh, which is re available recorded on uh, at, at www.hiv.gov um, under the syringe services uh, uh, tab, um, because we had representatives there talking about uh, how to get access to federal funds to support um, certain aspects of certain services programs. And that is happening now. So I would encourage you, if you do get uh, CDC, SAMHSA, or HRSA funding, to talk with your project officer about the needs and about how, uh, whether you can currently or in future use that funding for uh, for syringe service programs. Um, but aside from the federal government, we, we can't possibly fund uh, the need that we have uh, in all of uh, the country to you know, get folks access to the, to the services they need. So I wanted to ask uh, Grace if she, if you could, um, you know, you mentioned the, the funding letter that a church uh, partner wrote. Um, but in a general way, could you could you describe sort of the the different types of funders that you've um, been able to 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 work with, and either currently or in the past? Sure. Um, so we have a very close relationship also with our state health department. They've been um, very supportive. Again, they're also like half a mile from here and um, we have a good relationship with them. And they've been a um, champion and supporter and funder of us for the entirety of our uh, time as a, as a syringe service program. The advocacy in the legislature was really focused around the tobacco settlement funding that Vermont came into. Um, we won some tobacco settlement funds and uh, worked through the legislature to designate to the health department that that funding go to syringe service programs. And we do have some small family foundations that fund us um, and, uh, and really focus on uh, smaller amounts, but targeted amounts. So that's been really great and helpful. Uh, syringe service programs are, are hard to fund. It is one of the challenges, especially when you know that this is such an, um, an incredible resource and an effective resource. Uh, one of the hardest things as a person who runs a program is fighting for the dollars to pay the people to do it and to support uh, the syringe exchange, support syringe services. Um, we spend over $100,000 on supplies in a year and things like that. So it's, there's, a, there's a cost to it. Um, but I do think that things have improved and are improving, um, but it is something, and, and I think the farther we go down the evidence-based uh, processes in, in different areas and um, with different foundations and things, I think that this is where syringe service programs really shine. Um, but it is a, it, it's, it's part of, when you run a syringe service program, it's part of one of the um, big focuses is, is, is keeping it sustainably funded and so that you can provide as many services and as broad as services as, as possible. Thanks, Grace. Um, just to follow on, uh, Daniel, I, maybe you have some insight. Um, if someone's looking to start, um, establish a new syringe service program, they haven't been doing this before, um, what, what kind of advice, what, where would you recommend that they uh, look first for, for funding to really get their, their program started? 
Yeah, I, so it doesn't actually cost that much to uh, start a program, especially if you want to start on a small scale, if you can avail yourselves of volunteer time. Uh, the, the challenge that we are in in this current moment is that we need uh, to mobilize more private funders. Uh, we've, got, uh, we've got some allies in the funding world, in the HIV funding world, uh, that have traditionally invested in uh, supporting harm reduction in services programs. But the uh, need right now is to figure out how to broaden that out uh, because the growth of programs has outpaced the growth in the resources that they're making available. And, in fact, uh, a national organization which has funded syringe access programs is currently in a contraction phase. So I would echo what Grace said in terms of looking at local family foundations, uh, using the opportunity to educate some of the family and regional foundations and uh, other potential supporters, uh, which could include potentially your local United Way or Kiwanis Club that may have a stake in responses to the opioid overdose epidemic about how your program contributes to that work. Um, that using a broader opioid lens or drug user health lens or harm reduction lens helps people make the connection between the kinds of charitable causes that they're interested in supporting and the ways that your program can be part of that solution. Um, I'm going to drop a link in the chat box to our guide to developing and managing syringe access programs, uh, which we released several years ago. We have some tips on funding in that that I think we're probably going to be looking to update over the next year. I wish I could say there's a magic bullet, but I've been impressed by the persistence, resourcefulness, creativity, and resilience of programs popping up all across the country that start in a shoestring and build from there. Thanks, Daniel. I think you may have just uh, also answered the, the next question I was going to ask, um, which is great because we're going to run short on time here. Um, I, I wonder uh, also, Daniel, if you could um, tell us, do you know, uh, in terms of where to initiate uh, SSP services or expanding to new uh, areas, are there um, ways to easily figure out where best to put a syringe service program? Yeah, the easiest way is to talk to the people who will use the program. Uh, so take your cues, uh, whether it's through a focus group or just informally asking or consulting or, uh, you know, ideally even uh, compensating people for their time, talk to people who use drugs, people who inject drugs about where they are and are not willing to go. Uh, we've heard stories about programs that get uh, set up across the street from the local jail because that was the location that already had some kind of services or staffing, only to find that that's actually uh, unacceptable to the population that they're trying to reach. So I, th I think that there's lots of options that will inform not just the location, but the service model. Some areas might benefit more from a mobile unit. Some areas might benefit more from a delivery model, uh, whether it's due to uh, transportation and geographic concerns or concerns about stigma and anonymity. But your local community is going to be the ideal resource to guide your choices there. Thanks, Daniel. So Grace, there seems to be a lot of interest in uh, the low barrier buprenorphine program that you've um, added to your, the services that, that your program provides. Um, do you have any uh, suggestion on resources that the folks uh, on the line can access if they're interested in adding buprenorphine or learning more about low barrier buprenorphine uh, uh, initiation? Yes, yeah, so um, we started the low barrier buprenorphine program with, um, with our local uh, 
well, we have a blueprint for health through our health department that allows you, if you have 100 patients, to have a doctor and some staffing. Um, and we started with the idea that that's the direction we were, we were heading in um, and got some uh, support from our, like Daniel said, our local United Way and a couple other, um, we have a Chittenden County Opioid Alliance, people put money together, but we also wrote that, uh, SAMHSA grant, um, a Matt, P Matt Padoa grant and um, received that in a pretty timely fashion. Things don't always happen like that in harm reduction, but the way it worked was that we were able to get up and started uh, very quickly and um, with the with also the this the proper staffing getting a doctor our first doctor who was very interested in harm reduction services because the main thing with the low barrier program is that the syringe exchange is a home to many people who don't have another place where they can go and talk about their drug use or be um, authentic about what's going on for them and so you really don't want to change or invade that in any way we're lucky that we have a two-story building so um, we work very hard to make sure that happens but um, we were able to fund it uh, sort of serendipitously, luckily, through uh, a merging of all these funds. And we've really seen a lot of, um, you know, it's just been a, a really amazing addition to our services in that, you know, offering somebody treatment for me for most of my career meant that we were putting them on a two-year waiting list and watching the things that happened to them in those two years. And so to be able to give them treatment the same day, and we are giving treatment the same day, um, or to have somebody come out of jail and know that they have treatment Im immediately. We have a lot of um, participants that come here before they've even seen family members or friends and getting right into treatment. So um, we're really, and, we, and I said, we saw a 50% reduction in overdose deaths. So I think um, there's a lot to be said for it. It's a lot of work, but, um, and the main thing is to make sure that you preserve the culture of your syringe service program. So adding staff, staffing that really focuses on that and makes sure that people feel comfortable in the same place they've always gone. Thanks, Grace. Um, the, there's been a couple of questions on uh, local, localities or jurisdictions, um, you know, some jurisdictions still have uh, policies or legislation or um, uh, other limits on whether or not a syringe service program can operate within them. Um, Daniel, is there a, a resource or a, some advice you could give to folks who are looking their first you know need when they look to establish an SSP is to make the policies you know uh, able to sustain a, a, the program do you have any advice on that yeah sure I I have three suggestions uh, maybe four and they'll be very brief one is that lawatlas.com is a compilation of public health laws which uh, could be a good first place to look to if you're trying to research the status of the laws in your state. It is at state level. I believe it includes DC, Puerto Rico, and the uh, associated territories. Um, second is if you're uncertain, uh, reach out to me. Uh, me or somebody in our organization has probably asked ourselves that question and figured something out. So we might be able to provide some clarity. Uh, the third is that we also are very supportive of advocacy efforts to educate legislators about why they might want to reconsider if they have unnecessary barriers, and we'd be happy to support some thinking about that. And fourth is I want to acknowledge that some programs have operated very successfully in absence of enabling state law by buying, getting buy-in and local support from local police and elected officials and other stakeholders. So those are my four responses. Thank you so much. Uh, maybe just one more um, that Grace might be able to answer. Uh, what's your most effective advertising strategy? How do you attract folks that really need SSP services or that could use them to, to your program? Well, we've been, um, it's really word of mouth for us because we've been in, um, in the same location as a syringe. Well, we've been a syringe service program for about 19 years. And so we have um, 5,000 clients in a state that's pretty small. Um, so people really do bring their friends and their family members here. Um, but we have now have buy-in from places like the police departments, um, the hospital, 
the um, even even parts of the Department of Corrections that do send people here. So we have a lot of referrals from other services. So we don't do a ton of advertising. It's really word of mouth. Um, and uh, a lot of those providers, just like the police department, it's, uh, it's really a true understanding of what we do here. It's not a um, off the cuff referral from them. The, our police department is incredibly supportive and part of them being supportive is that they trust us and don't get involved. So they make, you know, they tell people to come here all the time. Um, so I think it's really getting buy-in from your local partners and mostly it's, it's uh, participants talking to each other. Thanks so much, Grace. Um, so we are out of time. I'm so sad because we had amazing questions on stigma and discrimination, uh, on syringe disposal, uh, so many questions. I, I wanted to get to all of them, but I will turn it back over to Sharon to close. Thank you so much, Karina. And that was a rapid round of question and answers. And I think you know, people really got a lot of great insight. The whole webinar has been informative, engaging, and inspiring. We want to thank our planning committee, the presenters, and all of our participants for joining us today. When the webinar concludes, please click the continue button in the window, and that will open so that you can provide feedback on today's session. We're also gonna follow up with a recording of the webinar, a link to the presentation slides, and the contact information for your regional health administrator. We believe that together we can combat the nation's opioid crisis and end the HIV epidemic. And one way to achieve these goals is to expand access to SSPs. So thank you so much for your participation and enjoy the rest of your day.